church on a Sunday morning, awesome. Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day, everyone. My name is Taylor Leal and I am the early childhood director here. I am the mom of a crazy toddler who is two years old. His name is Jax and he's so much fun. Um, and actually, I wanna take this time to recognize all the moms in the room. So would you please stand up with me if you are a mom and don't be shy because then it would be awkward for me to be the only one standing. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. You guys are awesome. Yeah, we love moms. Um, well, like I said, my name is Taylor and I'm the early childhood director here. So that means I oversee what happens birth through preschool. And I wanted to tell you, if you have a child that's in the room right now, um, I encourage you to go check out our program because uh, we, our children of all ages that have programs during all services they hear an incredible Bible story that's applicable to their age. We do worship with them. They engage with a small group leader and they do activities with them. And we just, we have a full-fledged program going on back there and I would hate for your child to miss out on all the fun. And I promise they do not pay me to say these things. I just truly believe in what we're doing back there. So um, if you have a child and they're in the auditorium, I mean, they're, they're welcome to stay with you, but we would love for them to be part of our program. Um, another thing, I've been encouraging our friends and our families that are back in K-Kids, I've really been encouraging them to do this five, Hope Water 5K run. And so raise your hand if you've ever, if you've heard about Hope Water, we've talked about it a lot. Maybe you ran the marathon, if you did, you're amazing. Um, we talk about Hope Water a lot here and I wanna uh, show you this video about a 5K that we're actually gonna be kicking off this summer. Hey Kensington community, it's Heather here with Hope Water Project. We are so excited to announce that this year is our fifth annual Hope Water Project 5K event. What a great opportunity for a community of people on mission to come together to provide clean water to our brothers and sisters in Kenya. This event is for all ages, all athletic abilities. We invite all of you to join us. You know, last year, with our 500 registered participants, our numerous corporate sponsors, and our awesome fundraising community, we raised enough money to build two wells in Kenya. That is clean water for up to 4,000 people. And that clean water helps to restore health, provide education, and a future for our friends. So, grab your sneakers, grab your family, 
Invite your neighbors, invite everyone. We would love to see an even bigger event this year, providing more opportunity to bring clean water to our friends in Western Kenya. June 22nd, our family will be there. I'm excited, and you know what? If, you, if the marathon is a little bit intimidating to you or running is not your thing, I think the 5K would be an awesome um, opportunity for all of us to get involved. In fact, one of our values here is as a family, and I think it would be so fun to see all the families here at our Troy campus show up at this 5K, and you know what? I'm not even gonna run it. I'm probably gonna push the stroller the whole time, and it's gonna be awesome. So I would love for you to come and join us for that 5K. The next thing I want to bring you to bring bring to your attention is a series that we have starting next week called Into the Wild. And so this series is gonna be asking all of those what if questions that we have, like what if I took that step that I, I really wanted to take? Or what if the dreams that were inside of me actually came to fruition? We're gonna be asking ourselves, what if I lived without fear? And so during the course of the, the couple weeks that the series is gonna be on, we're gonna be talking about those things, asking ourselves those questions, and I think we're gonna better understand what it's like to have obedience, what it's like to have faith, what it's like to walk in confidence with Jesus. And so I would hate for you to miss the series that's coming up next week. Well, I think that's all the announcements that we have for today. I would love for you guys to stand up, say hello to the people around you, greet them, give a high five, and wish the moms a happy Mother's Day. And so that's hard with kids. Uh, there's definitely days when I have my doubts about my abilities. I struggle with my temper. I struggle with like how I react with situations. I wish I knew how to, I guess, just calm myself before speaking to them. I wish I was better at taking time to sit down and just listen more to my child. I wish I was more confident and being a mom. I'm not the most patient person in the world. Patience. Patience is far and away probably the biggest struggle. I just want them to know just how much I love them. My mom is totally awesome. She's fun to snuggle with. Pretty, funny. She does cook a lot of food for me. She's just unique. That's why I love her so much. We go on dates together. Like, we go shopping. She loves me a lot. I have a lot of favorite things about my mom. We like to watch movies together and color and stuff. We go to church together, we volunteer together. She is like my heart, I guess you could say, because she's that close to me. My favorite thing is to jump on a trampoline with my mom. That's my most favorite thing to go up high. We like get ice cream or something and like you go to the nail salon and have fun. <laughs> my mommy's my hero. She's pretty and beautiful. She is my hero. She just will care about me and just always love me forever. She's the best. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> I always seem to focus mostly on the negative, and I guess I can walk out of here and say that I'm doing something great, and that my child is viewing me in totally different lenses as I view myself. So that's, that's inspiring. 
this is my calling, this is my job, this is what I love to do and I will do it better and with love each and every day because those kids count on me and they love me for what I'm doing. just noticed my mama's right here and isn't she lovely but I'm gonna say for this service this this is for you mom isn't she lovely isn't she wonderful isn't she precious
Thank you so much. That is amazing. And uh, where are you, Jen? There you are. That's got to be the best Mother's Day song you've ever heard. That is incredible. Wow. You know, um, in the early years of Kensington, I remember um, there were some years where I thought, man, I don't know if the music is quite what it used to be, but I got to tell you, the last few years with Jalen and this team, they are flat out amazing, aren't they? That is incredible. And not just that, but, but people of such love and character and kindness and just the, the beauty of Christ in them is just amazing. Well, what a wonderful day we celebrate. This is a, there's nothing like Mother's Day, I've got to tell you. And I, uh, two days ago, I got to talk on, on the phone with my mom for about 45 minutes, and I was thinking, I was actually trying to remember, but in the last 40 years, I don't even know if I've been with my mother on Mother's Day more than once or twice. You know, usually we're separated by 750 miles, and, um, and so we, we have to talk on the phone to celebrate this day. And she's 93, she's 93 and a half, and I just thought, there's no one in my life that laid down their life for me more than my mom. Probably Paula, my wife would be a, a close second. But it's interesting, on the phone this week, we just talked about what Jesus has been teaching us. And she still reads voraciously. She reads through the Bible a couple times a year. She reads every book that's recommended to her. She's just an amazing thing. And I thought, she has been um, the, probably the person that discipled me most in my life. But I really want to honor women today. And I thought, there's a lot of single moms, there's a lot of adoptive moms. There's a lot of foster moms. There's a lot of women here at Kensington that are not moms who disciple younger women as if they were their own children. I thought these are the things that make an incredible difference. And I celebrate you all. And I thought some of you lost your moms. Some of you didn't have a relationship with your mom that you wanted to have. And, you, and sometimes Mother's Day is painful. I just want you to know something. Whatever that is, God wants to take that to you as a woman to use that for you to invest in the lives of younger women. Just want you to know, that's just part of what God does. And I thought about the women who discipled me, especially in the formative years of my life. Women who were not my biological mother, but treated me as if I was their true son. There are people I've talked very little about through the years. Jeannie McKinney, a woman who was a part of my formative years in an unbelievable way was one of the most powerful influences in my life, was actually the person that actually prophesied over me when I was five years old that God was going to call me into leadership in ministry in his church. And I remember not even liking hearing that. But that's what God did. Jesse Mae Wilson, uh, my aunts, Patty and Aunt Lucy, who had such an incredible impact on my life. Alma Heron was a woman who worked for our family. They are so loved and remembered in my heart. That's what I want you to know today. And I think you have similar women in your life. And I thought Mother's Day, if it's about anything, is about sacrificial love, isn't it? It's about surrender. And so today, I want to tell you, just I want to walk through the story that many of you heard when you dedicated your children to Christ, the story of Hannah in the Old Testament. I love it in many ways because it's really the story of Paula in my life and how God worked in our life as well. So I just want to take some minutes to roll through this and enjoy it with you. And so let's just jump in in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathiam, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim. In fact, as you read this, you've got to love language. you just got to love the diversity of language. This man's name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph. And I guess that's where you get the Zuphite part from, I'm just guessing. An Ephraimite. And he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Now, if you just hear this story, if you're operating without oper uh, understanding kind of ancient history, this was an age of polygamy. And it's important to know that it was never designed by God in the Bible. There was, not, there was no affirmation of polygamy ever in the scriptures, but people did it. It was part of uh, the history, really, up until recent times. Women in this context who were unable to have children were viewed differently. Now, that sounds odd in our culture now, because in our culture, children are optional. Children are often an afterthought. In modern history, 
Children are something to be easily discarded. Children in those days were everything to people. Children were the sign of blessing. Children were the future hope. Children were the economic engine. They were social status. They were the labor force. It's very different than today, isn't it? I have four kids, and I have yet to reap one penny of reward for that. <laughs> in fact, a lot of you that know the Kensington vision, we have, uh, we have actually now been involved in helping start 79 churches in the United States. Uh, this has been an amazing thing. But, but yeah, before you clap, it's like having children. We send people out, we send money out, and so far, nothing has ever returned. It's a great business strategy. But it's a beautiful way to live, isn't it? And so, in this story for Hannah, she was probably Elkanah's first wife. Look at, listen to researchers, other people have talked about this. Uh, she was probably the wife of his youth, the girl he married for love. But when she couldn't have children, it's very possible he got a second wife for economic reasons. He had to have children. It was a matter of life and death. So women who had lots of children were heroes, but not in this case for Peninnah. And women who couldn't felt worthless. Now, I just want to say something to women in general. Women, in my experience, as I've known the, 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 my children, my wife, my daughters, my mother, women struggle so often in a deeper way of self-evaluating their own self-image than men do. A lot of us men kind of roll through life and we're doing pretty good. Women are often very, very tough on themselves. And I thought, in this age, Hannah was in a very difficult situation, but so was Peninnah. And for Hannah to have killed children, it became like an idol in her life. She's like, I'm never going to be happy if I don't have kids. And it's interesting. Paula and I went through four years of infertility. We were told by the head of the infertility specialist at Vanderbilt University in 1984 that we would ne never have children. And we were heartbroken by that. We had to experience all the grief of that. And so I think like Hannah, I kind of made children my idol. And when we started having kids, I, I literally didn't travel for 20 years after my kids were born. I didn't, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to be away from my kids. In fact, I tell my kids now, I said, y'all would have probably turned out a lot better if I'd have traveled a little bit. <laughs> but I just, I just never wanted to be anything but a father and a grandfather. I'm, I'm still that way now. Uh, I was with one of my grandsons uh, at the park last week, and uh, uh, I was just thinking how I delight in my, my, my kids and my grandkids, and you, you, you feel the same way. Um, in fact, that's how, I del that's how I feel about you. Leading this place, it's been the, the same way. When I greet you, welcome you. I'm just so grateful God has brought you to my life. But CK, is he just turned four, and uh, I know you've never had children or grandchildren like this, but he kind of resists when it's time to go potty, when it's time to go big potty. So we were at the park, and he was starting to do his potty dance, which kind of looks like this. I don't know where this comes from. It's, a little, uh, it's probably from my wife's side. He's a little bit weird. And... Uh, and so Paula looks at me, she's like, yeah, I think you need to get him to the bathroom at the park. So we start running. And the whole time we're running over there, he's kind of resisting me, not real hard, but he's like, no, thank you, Gimpy. No, thank you. No, thank you, Gimpy. I'm like, no, thank you, what? Like, he, I said, it's okay, buddy. I said, I lied. I said, I need to go too. So we got in there. And so I got him, uh, and if this is too much information, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> we get in there, and uh, so we go right to the urinal, and and he's got like five drops. And I'm like, okay, this isn't working, so that's obviously not the potty dance we're doing. And all of a sudden I get this powerful, overwhelming aroma as we're standing at the urinal. And like, so I grab him, I'm rushing, you know, to the, to the big potty. I get him there, literally, it's so close, I look down to see if my shoes are okay. <laughs> and he looks up at me and he goes, Gimpy, I guess I should have told you so. I'm like, yeah, that would have helped a lot. And then, um, so I went over to the sink, um, give him a break, and all of a sudden I hear him say, oh, Gimpy, pee. Well, now the pee comes. I come in there, and he's peed all over his blue jeans. His underwear is soaked. He's very unhappy. And uh, we figured it out. 
But I, I, I was actually asking my staff, he said, do you know what I was feeling the whole time? Absolute delight. <laughs> there is something that's happened in me that I don't care anymore. I don't care if my grandkids are fast or slow. I don't care if they're beautiful or homely. I don't care if they're brilliant or if they have special learning problems. I don't care. Something switched in me. All I feel is delight. And that's what Hannah longed to feel. That's what I'm sure Panina felt. I'm sure that's what you feel over the people in your life. That's, I just looked at, just Jeff and Gene, just looking, like when I saw you, I didn't know you were there. I feel delight. It's, it's what God does in his family. And so, Hannah's in a rough spot. So let's look at her story. Year after year, Elkanah, Hannah's husband, would go up from his town to worship and sacrifice. This was a Jewish place of sacrifice in Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two evil sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came, for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. Like, she was very fertile. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Now, just a couple things I want you to see that are really sad in this story. One is Peninnah has given her husband sons and daughters, but she's not loved. And the grief and the pain of that, Hannah is loved, but she can't enjoy it because, she, because God has not given her the desires of her heart. And it's interesting that as I think about how the Lord had closed her womb, like sometimes God does things to us that we do not like, but he's doing them for some greater purpose. And sometimes we don't even know what it is in this lifetime. And I just gotta be honest with you, when God does this, I hate it. In our years of infertility, I was so mad at God when I watch one of my kids struggle now, I, do, I like, God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing that? There's not one person in this room that, that, that doesn't know what I'm talking about at some level. And so because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. I mean, how frustrating are these two women living together? One is unloved, one is unloved, but unfulfilled. And this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and she would not eat. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like shame. The only time people can't eat, usually, is when you feel such shame in your life about things that you've done wrong, things that you feel disgraced about, things that you're disappointed about. It's like even the taste of food has no benefit to you. And then her husband steps in, and I gotta tell you, Elkanah is representative of the brilliant husbands in the world. He says to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Guys, that's funny. <laughs> this guy is an idiot. He has no clue. And she's like, no, I would actually trade you for one son. Actually, that's in the Andrews version. But like most men, he overrates himself. No, Elkanah, you're not that good. So you have all of this. And even in the story, you have Eli, the priest whose own sons have become, in a sense, horrible human beings. So once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. I want you to, if you're, if you're looking at your Bible, or you're marking your U version, you're taking, is it, this always marks a moment when a person is sitting and they stand up. This is a moment of decision. And Eli the priest was sitting in his chair by the doorpost, and in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord, if you'll only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now that's weird. Nobody, none of us would even know what that would mean. But what she's saying is Hannah is not a woman from the priestly line. So if she has a son, she cannot, he cannot be a priest except with one exception. Non-priestly families in Israel could give their son to the worship of God at the temple or in the service of the priestly role if they took the Nazarite vow. 
which meant in one thing it meant that their hair would never be cut that's what we that was the story of samson right probably had a nazarite vow he, he never cut his hair and when he did he lost his strength you remember that and so she is saying if you would give me a child i'll give it back to you and i thought this is interesting and I just have a simple principle for you today. I don't have it on the screen, but I want you to think about it. In my life, disappointment, disgrace, and despair is what Jesus has used most in my life. Isn't that frustrating? Wouldn't you love to say that the blessings of God or this or that, but for me, it's, it's the things that hurt me most that Jesus used most to reach me. And to moms here today that are feeling discouraged about your life Maybe as a parent or as a, or as a person, I just got to tell you, Jesus can use even those things. And it may be for some of you today, it's time to arise, to stand up, and to take action. This is a spiritual turning point for her. Now, in verses 12 to 18, I'm not going to read all this, but you can see it on the screen. I just want to talk about it for a second. She was talking to God in such a way that Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. And I thought about this. I thought, where have I ever seen this? Last year in Nepal, when I was in one of the safe houses with about 40 or 50 of the girls who've been rescued from human trafficking, when we had a time of prayer, I noticed that every single girl would pray like this. And they would weep. The tears would pour in their face. And they're just pleading with God. They're talking to God. And I don't know what they were praying. But I, I could tell they were praying out of utter desperation. I've never seen prayer like that anywhere in my life and these women by the way that we're serving with Ramesh are being transformed and are transforming regions and villages and places in Nepal they're absolutely the most amazing women I've ever seen because they're they're the most destroyed the most transformed this is what Jesus is doing with Hannah and so he basically she says to, to Eli, I'm not drunk. I'm not a bad person. And then Eli, in verse 17, says, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked him. And it's interesting. I don't know what Eli's motivation was, because Eli was kind of messed up himself. You, you read the rest of Samuel. Eli was struggling with his own demons. But he tells this woman, I hope God answers you, because I can tell you're praying with an incredible amount of earnestness. And so... The next morning, they go back. Uh, they go back to their home. Elkanah and Hannah make love. The Lord remembers her. She becomes pregnant. She gives birth to a son, and she names him Samuel. And this is the part I want you to see. She says, his name is Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. The literal meaning of the name Samuel is God listens. God listens. Isn't that amazing? To think if you were going to think about the God that you didn't believe in in parts of your life or the God that you're mad at, that God is identified in all of these names in the Old Testament. The God who hears, the God who listens, the God who sees, the God who knows, the God who loves, the God who transforms. All of these are names for God in the Old Testament. And all of these are revealed in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ takes on human form, all of these things are fleshed out. And Samuel becomes the living image to his mom that God listens. God takes our disappointment, disgrace, and despair and re replaces them with a promise and an answer and a great step of faith. It's interesting. I told you, Paul and I had these years of infertility, and we gave up, and then all of a sudden, she got pregnant. And I remember every day of her pregnancy, I was totally in panic. Like, like will God protect this child? We had one of the worst deliveries I've ever, ever heard about and certainly was the most terrifying moment of our life um, when Lindy was born, but, she, but eventually she came out alive. She's serving today at Life Church Auburn Hills, which is one of our recent churches we're helping start, which meets at Auburn Elementary right by Avondale High School. And I asked her to do the message, but she was serving there today. But it's interesting, she was my miracle child. Every time I look at her, I know for a fact that God listened to me. Even in the teenage years when she didn't like me, even when she would look at me and go, man, I can't wait to get out of this house and go to college. And I remember thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't have prayed for you. <laughs> you know, it was one of those moments where you kind of feel in the pain. But she turned out to be such 
an amazing and an elegant, incredible woman. And she's an image of God listening. CK is her son. CK, every time I'm with CK or Marguerite, it's an image to me that God listens. And I want you to not leave here today and not knowing that God hears every cry of your heart, like everything you've ever worried about, the things that, that just dog your spirit every day. He knows and he loves you. And so she goes to another level of surrender. In verse 24, it says, after he was weaned, she took the boy with her. He was probably about three years old, along with a three-year-old bull, which what did that mean about Hannah and her and Elkanah? It meant they were a wealthy family. You sacrifice a bull, you're big time. She had an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. But none of that was the big sacrifice. After the bull had been sac sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said, pardon me, Lord, as surely as I live. I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted me what I asked of him. You see, Hannah's offering was Samuel. And this is interesting, because I, uh, Eli, remember, there are thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people rolling through. What are the chances that he even remembered her? Probably very unlikely. She doesn't know that, he's, that she's coming back, that she's been intending for four years since she got pregnant to bring her child and to give her back to Eli. In fact, this is a good time for us to receive our offering. I thought, this is the offerings of our life are what we bring to Jesus. So money today, for those of you that are investing with us in the mission of God in the world, I don't know if you heard this recently, but we just got a report back from the POCOT that 51 new churches were launched this fall. Think about that. Just in one of our 10 global partners, one place, God doing unbelievable things. And so I just want you to know that what's happening here and what's happening in the world is worth your life and worth your investment. So and if you're visiting with us as a mom or with your mom today, you're welcome to let this go by as well. There's no pressure on that either. But I thought, here's something amazing. Hannah prays for a child. God gives her a son. And she comes up to Eli in verse 28. He's completely unsuspecting. And she says this, so now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And it says that Samuel worshiped the Lord there at Shiloh. Now this doesn't make sense to me. For Hannah to fulfill her vow, she has to surrender her miracle child. It's kind of circular logic, Cliff Johnson would say. She begs God to give a son and then promises if God does, she'll give him back. But let me ask you, moms, is there anything in life but giving back the people we love? You ever tried to hold on to anybody? If you try to hold on to someone, what do you do? You stifle them. The whole purpose of love is to release and empower. And this is the hardest thing for a parent to do. It's the hardest thing for a spouse to do. It's the hardest thing for a friend to do. I can tell you, leading a church where we launch people out continually, it's hard to do. But this is life. This is what is the beautiful part of life. I remember uh, Lindy, our miracle child. She was a senior at Wheaton College, which by the way, some of you remember I played football, Wheaton College. We, we call it the powerhouse in the Midwest. And uh, it's stupid, I don't know why I said that. Um, but Lindy, her senior year, was gonna do a six month mission in Burkina Faso. I've told this story. How many of you have ever even heard of Burkina Faso? Let me see if show hands. Okay, like six people in the room. You don't even know there's a country, Burkina Faso. The capital city is Ouagadougou, which is officially the greatest capital city in the world as a name. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you love to live? People say, where do you live? I live in Ouagadougou. <laughs> Come on, that's a great name. It's amazing. And so she was getting ready to go. Burkina Faso is about 99% Muslim. She was going to be working with a French Christian relief agency with children. HIV, children had HIV. And about two weeks before she left, I said, so who's picking you up at the airport? She says, I don't know. She said, they'll have somebody at the airport. Well, guys, this is post 9-11, and she's going to all Muslim country, and she doesn't know who's picking her up at the airport. And I, fr I freaked out. And I'm a risk taker with my kids. I'm like, that is crazy. You're going to fly into an all Muslim country. You're a 
single young woman, 21 years old, and you don't even know who's picking you up at the airport? And she, I just remember this, this is one of those great moments. She goes, she goes, listen here, Dad. So when that happens, your kid does it, that's not a good moment. <laughs> She's, listen, God's called me to do this. I've got this. Okay. I didn't like that at all. <laughs> so she flies. And you, some of you remember this, you who know, know me, but as she went through security at Metro, and right before she took the escalator down at the Delta, she turned and looked back and waved and then disappeared. Man, I'll tell you, that was one of the toughest moments of my life. We had to wait five days to hear that she was safely where, where she was. We waited five days to hear, hey, email, I'm here. I'm with a wonderful family. It was great. But you got to let go. You got to surrender. What is surrender? It's not apathy. Believe me, it's not a disconnected heart. Surrender is the hardest thing in the world to do. I was thinking even the things that, that where I've grown the most is where I've surrendered not only to God, but to other people. I have a, a friend, Dave Smith, who knows all of my finances. He has all of my passwords, all my codes. He is in accountability partner with Paul and me on everything, on everything I do with my money. There's not one thing I do financially he doesn't know about. And you know what? Since I asked him to be my, my accountability partner nine years ago, my finances have completely changed for the better. My life, my physical health challenge, when I finally got accountable to people at Weight Watchers and joined them, that was a, a humbling, beautiful moment in my life. I have people who are accountable to me for everywhere I go on the computer and the internet, who, who know, who get a, get a report. It's like... It's like being willing to be weak and to be accountable to other people. And every time I've done it, in every area of my life, my life's better for it. You know what's not good? Isolation. You know what is great? Community. Living in accountable relationships with other people. This makes a huge difference. And here's the thing I want you to see about this story. It's so amazing. Eli is not expecting a son. Hannah is giving up her son. Eli's two sons are destroying the nation of Israel. And you know what God in his grace does for Eli? He gives him another son that he never expected was coming. It's not his son. Samuel becomes his non-biological son. He raises him. He invests in him. And you know what Samuel does? He grows up in the darkest time of Israel's history. It was spiritual, moral, civil confusion. And he guides Israel. He literally saves the nation because of Hannah's suffering. Because of her sacrifice, her nation was saved. Sounds a lot like Mary, doesn't it, in the New Testament? It's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus saving us from our enemies. It's the love of God giving his son. It points us to the cross. And in the cross, we see the ultimate suffering and sacrifice that comes out of Jesus' life. Dave Wilson actually sent me this note yesterday. He said, if you trust Christ then Hannah's God is your God. Your bitterness of soul, your loss of appetite, your weeping can all be redeemed and don't give up. We have a redeemer who makes broken things new. I just love that. So as you think about this day, I want you to do something for me as we wrap up. As uh, Jalen and the team got a couple of beautiful songs we're gonna sing, they're just awesome. But there is, is just a principle I want you to know that surrender never means apathy. Surrender is an active decision of your life. Do you think it's apathetic for me when I asked Dave, I said, Dave, I want, you to, I want you to hold me accountable for everything I do financially. It's the opposite of apathy. It's engagement, it's commitment, it's accountability. This is what surrender really looks like to God. But there's something that happens. I want you to think about Hannah again. She's, she doesn't have any other children. She drops him off. She goes back to her village. It says in 1 Samuel 2, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. And each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Man, how hard would that be? Which, by the way, I was a missionary kid in Africa back in 68 and 69, and I went to the Rift Valley Academy and I went to school with about 400 missionary kids whose parents lived thousands of miles away all over Africa. And their parents saw them for a, a two or three weeks, three times a year. 
That's how those kids grew up. First graders, kindergartners, first graders, second graders. And I thought, what an incredible sacrifice. That's what Hannah did. I, I can't imagine. There's no way God would have to strike me dead to make me willing to have, to have made me willing to do that with my kids. But God called Hannah to do that. But every year, she would get on her loom and she would make him a little robe for the next year. She'd grow, it'd be a little bit bigger each year, which meant that she didn't, it was the opposite of non-engagement. She was thinking and praying about him all the time. So today we're doing something kind of cool to end the service. We have baskets that the usher's gonna bring down that have yarn in them. And uh, I've been kind of, I've been kind of, uh, I've cut, I have three big things in my life that I feel like God is calling me to surrender to him. And I've just been, been wanting to leave them somewhere, somewhere visible. And while we're singing here at the end of this service, I'm inviting some of you, I was trying, gonna, trying to pin that off. I want some of you to come and cut a piece of yarn as a symbol of surrendering what it is that you need to surrender to God. Maybe it's a drug addiction. Maybe, maybe there are people in this room that are probably addicted to opioids. Some of you are addicted to pornography. Some of you uh, have been unfaithful in your family. Some of you are in financial difficulty. Some of you have a, a child that is really suffering and you just, oh, it's all you think about. I want you to come down. We're gonna sing a couple of songs. There's gonna be plenty of time. I want you to just come down. There's like six or seven eight places that you can actually like 20 like just you can line up and cut a string of yarn if you want I talked to a friend last night she cut three she said yeah I need three and I said and then put them in a place where you're going to see them maybe put them on the the handle of your refrigerator door or put them on your uh uh by your desk where you read your bible in the morning or put it put it by your bedstand. I don't know what it would be but in this this let this piece of yarn or pieces of yarn be reminders of something you're surrendering to God. And here's how the story ends. 1 Samuel 2, verse 20, it said every year Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, may the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah, and she gave birth to three sons and two daughters, and meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Now, here's what you wouldn't notice if you didn't know the Bible. This last sentence of Samuel growing in stature and favor, this is the exact phrase used of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. That Je Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. Samuel was an image of of what God's love was gonna be like. And it all came because a woman was ready to surrender her heartache and her brokenness to God. So what do you need to surrender to God today? I don't know, but I want you to know something out of Hannah's life. Number one, your prayers matter. Your prayers matter. Number two, you're not alone. And when all else fails, keep looking up. In fact, I was thinking not being alone for smash women, it, I would love for another 100 women from Troy. I, I don't even know if we have room for 100 women, but it would be so awesome for you to go. If you're feeling isolated, Smash is the place for you. could be absolutely life-transforming for you. And so uh, Jalen and the team is going to lead this. You guys are just some beautiful stuff. They're going to lead us in a song now, and you can kind of sing along. It's simple. You can figure it out. But the song is You Know My Name. What, is it, what do we talk about today? We talk about the God who listens, who knows our pain, knows our struggles. Whatever it is, he knows your name. He has a purpose for your life, just like he did for Hannah and Samuel. So when you're ready, come down and grab your yarn and then go back to your seat. Let's just, we'll just enjoy. We got plenty of time to do it. And let's see what God is calling you to surrender.
how you talk, talk with me. And oh, how you tell me that I am your own, as you see, you know, you know my name. You you know
Stand and sing this long, this last song together. Yeah.
I tell you, it's been a, it doesn't get any better than that, man. I tell you, it's just beautiful. As we were singing, the thing that kept coming into my mind was there are people that we're in life with all over the world that are living out their true identity in Jesus Christ as beloved sons and daughters of the King who sent his own son to redeem us and buy us back, to, that he surrendered all for us. And as we're singing, there, people are singing different songs, but we have believers in Afghanistan that can't even sing out loud above a whisper. They can't even sing out loud above a whisper because if they're found out, they'll be killed. But they love Jesus Christ. There are thousands of them in the mountains of Afghanistan that we support between the mountains of Pakistan and Afghanistan. They can't even sing out loud. And here we are today, we're singing, we're just celebrating in a way that they will only be able to do when they're in heaven someday. And then these, these girls in Nepal, believers in Cuba, our friends in the West Bank, uh, the Palestinian evangelical Christians that I got to worship with a couple weeks ago, I'm telling you, we are part of an unbelievable movement of God, of people that have surrendered and have found the beauty of what it means to surrender our lives to Jesus. And then Jesus takes whatever that is that's surrendered and is gonna redeem it in ways that we can't even imagine. That's what he does. That's who he is. So it's been great to be here today. Uh, I just, I'm so thankful for you moms and for just treat the women in your life good today. Um, my, my wife's still cooking uh, the, the dinner afterwards for all of our kids to come for her Mother's Day gift. Uh, <laughs> typical mom. But there's so much to celebrate and so much goodness. And let me tell you, God is listening to you. He's hearing you. Don't leave here not knowing that today. And he loves you and he's given himself for you. So come back for In the Wild next week. You women go to Smash. Have a phenomenal Mother's Day. Great to be with you.